Hey, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Matt Petty. I'm Executive Director of ENHP. Uh, welcome to this webinar, Post-Election Grand Rounds for Single Payer, um, being led by Dr. Ed Weisbart, Chair of the ENHP Missouri Chapter. Um, if Ed is ready, I will turn it over to him. All right. Hey, thanks, Matt. And thanks, everybody, for coming in on what's typically a busy day this time of year. So I am delighted to have the chance to talk with you all about this. Um, I will be presenting a version of Grand Rounds. I'll be doing this mostly in character, uh, but uh, it, from time to time, you'll see I'll st actually step out of character to make a comment about the presentation itself. So I know we build this as post-election, and there will be some context of that uh, in this discussion, but. There won't be a lot on post-election strategies or anything of that sort as that would be highly speculative. You know, as we all know, most of that is still um, still unknown. So the slides we're showing will be available on the on the PNHP website. Uh, most of them are the PNHP slides that were shared at the national meeting a few weeks ago. There are a few extras that uh, I've added in, uh, and they will they will all be available. So. Let me go ahead and start. Uh, first thing I like to do at the oh, my slides aren't advancing. There we go. First thing I like to do at the beginning of a discussion is to mention that uh, I, like almost everybody in PNHP, and that's one of the few exceptions, are just an unpaid volunteer. We're not here to sell anything. We are uh, we have no conflicts of interest to disclose. My personal background uh, is that I'm a family physician. I practiced in Chicago for 20 years, and I moved to St. Louis in 2003 which I'll explain in a moment, and began volunteering at least once a week at Washington University. So I'm still seeing patients in one way or another at least at least once a week. I spent I moved to St. Louis in 2003 to become chief medical officer at Express Scripts, a, a, a pharmacy benefit manager that we could discuss more at the end if you're interested. Um, and uh, after retiring in 2010, about a couple of years later, I organized the Missouri chapter of uh, Physicians for a National Health Program. We now reach roughly 2,300 people across the state, although, of course, mostly in St. Louis, but we do have uh, some presence all over. So, oh, slides are not advancing. There we go. I have to do it this way, I guess. So, uh, to start off, here's some information that pretty much everybody who we'd be speaking to knows, which is that our life expectancy is not so great. Depends on, on whose data source you use, but typically we're number 28 or number 35, depending on how you, how you count it. On uh, the slides, some of these slides will have so many countries along the horizontal axis that people at a distance would have a hard time reading them. Uh, some will have very few, and it's not because we're cherry picking which data to show you, it's because they come from different data sources. So uh, in general, though, we will be the, the bar that's a different color. In this case, in most cases, you'll see we're all the way to the left, the, the red bar. So our life expectancy is pretty dreadful considering um, other things. Of course, healthcare is not the only thing that drives life expectancy, but it is an important one. And we'll come back in a little more detail on this uh, in a little bit. Um, you also probably know this, that we are the most expensive healthcare system in the world, spending roughly double the average of most other modern industrialized nations. So we will explain that a bit. But you may not have realized, again, staying in character now, that most of what we're spending on healthcare in the United States is already being funded by our tax system. Actually, two-thirds of what we're spending today comes from our tax dollars that we're all paying for. And this is not providing us with universal coverage. We still have tens of millions of people without any access, to, uh, without any health insurance. And you, you're familiar with the problems of that. But you didn't probably realize that two-thirds of what we're spending today is already government funded. And if you think about it, it comes from a variety of places. Number one, of course, uh, tax subsidies. Uh, where employers get a, get a discount for having, having uh, paid for the benefits, uh, government worker benefits, uh, the VA, public health, Medicaid and Medicare. If you put that all together, which it is fair to do, um, you find that actually two-thirds of what we're spending is coming from, uh, coming from public dollars. So why, why do we spend so much? Why do we have a system that is so heavily tax-funded uh, and yet is not providing with, with universal access to affordable coverage? What's, how, how do we spend so much? And I submit to you that there's two basic reasons. Number one, our prices are quite high, and number two, our system is needlessly complex. So prices, you're familiar with the prices being high. Here's almost a random choice of four, four drugs, and uh, we are the red bar, and some other country is the green bar. You can pick almost any other modern nation, and you can see that we spend 
outrageously more per drug than most other countries. And that was for examples, but if you look around the world, uh, we, we do indeed spend roughly double the, uh, the, the average in modern nations. As a result, almost 20 million Americans today are, going to, are buying their medications outside of the USA. They're buying them from Canada, they're buying them someplace overseas, typically Canada. And this number has gone up dramatically in the last five years. The last estimate, which was done with a, with a, a different methodology, suggested it was maybe 25% maybe of this number. So the number seems to have gone up significantly. Um, and most Americans would agree that this is not a good thing. Most Americans realize that if they, if they, when they realize that we've made a decision to not even let Medicare negotiate the prices of drugs, then most Americans, regardless of political party, think that that's a, that's a wrong strategic decision for the country. And, and Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, a strong majority in each group, uh, believe that we should let Medicare negotiate the prices of drugs. That's a more complex topic than we have time for today. Just giving Medicare the ability to negotiate drug prices is not really adequate. There need to be a number of other changes to bring down the prices of drugs. But that's the most egregious, obvious uh, thing that is a good intro to the topic. And it's not just the prices of drugs. It's actually the prices of most things in healthcare in the United States. So here's a few more things. CAT scans, uh, appendectomy, normal delivery. We spend an outrageous amount for, these, for each of these kinds of procedures. And as a result, almost three quarters of a million of us actually travel overseas for their health care every year. And, and this, is, this is really pretty disturbing when you think about the fact that we like to pride ourselves on having the best health care in the world, and, and yet three quarters of a million of us say, well, that may be true, but I'm going to go elsewhere for it regardless. And obviously it's because of price. And they go for the kinds of health care that that we like to think we're the best in the world at. They go for a cardiac surgery, orthopedic surgery. They go for these things that we think we're so great at, and maybe we are in many ways, but yet they just can't afford it. So they, they actually, almost a million of us actually leave the USA just for health care and go to countries that are, you know, very fine countries, but they're not the countries where you would necessarily think uh, we're having, uh, Americans are traveling for their health care. So, um, so it's price. It's not because we go to the physician very often. There we are uh, near the left of this chart, and you can see that we actually have uh, roughly four visits uh, to physicians uh, per year. Some countries have dramatically more, um, 10 or even 12 visits or more per year. Those visits on the far right-hand side are not 45-minute visits to their physician every month. They're brief visits. They're perhaps 30 seconds or 60 seconds or maybe two minutes just for a quick little check-in on their blood pressure or diabetes or some such thing. And if you think about it, that's a really encouraging way to improve somebody's health. It's a really simple thing you can do that, that encourages adherence, encourage, lets them know that you care and, and keeps people on track. Um, it's difficult to do those kinds of visits in the United States because we've made the process of delivering the care so complicated that visits at that frequency would, would be overwhelming. So again, complexity. We don't go that often. We don't have that many physicians compared to uh, other modern nations. Uh, but we lead the world at this. We lead the world at administrators and managers. Um, so this, this peaked up around the time that the managed care movement started. If you do the arithmetic and add up the number of people working in billing and accounts receivable in hospitals and compare that to the number of beds that hospitals have, we actually have more full-time equivalents working in billing and accounts receivable in hospitals than we have beds in hospitals. So the average hospital in the United States could, could currently, today, put a staff person from billing full-time at the foot of every bed and have an entire department left over. So that's kind of maybe amusing. I don't know. It's, it should be disturbing because that's incredibly expensive and doesn't really improve anybody's health. And indeed, you can see that over the last 15 years, hospital administration expenses have become increasingly expensive. We're now roughly 1.5% of our GDP just goes into the administration of hospitals because of how difficult we've made it to do that. Um, billing and accounts receivable, billing and insurance related administrative costs represent a dramatic chunk of what we spend our health care on. So 18% of our healthcare dollar today goes to billing and insurance related administration. It's such a big deal that it's actually got an acronym, BIR, and you'll see that uh, in the next few slides. 
So in this study, that was 18% of what we spent on healthcare is just for billing and insurance-related administration. And a big chunk of that, actually the biggest single portion of that, is what's paid by private insurers. But what you need to notice on this is that an awful lot of those costs are passed along to people like you and me, people that we're giving the grand rounds to, to the hospitals, and, and to the rest of us. So, um, but it's it's a big big chunk of funds. Public insurers are actually not the biggest piece um, of that. So we could spend more time on that, but in essence, the message here, of course, is that we spend a lot, not because we use so much, not because we go to physicians that much, or our, or our utilization. There are some issues there, but that's not the big driver. The big drivers are that our prices are so high, and we've created needless complexity. So usually at this point in a presentation, I'm going out of character, I stop because I like to start passing out these sign-up sheets to get people's contact information, and I stop, and I make the statement of something to be effective. If you like this kind of information and you want to see more about this, please uh, stay in touch with us. We're passing around these sign-up sheets, and it's best during a, a setting like a grand round, it's best if you can have someone else, ideally your host, start passing the sign-up sheets um, around. And you want to do that not at the very beginning, because they don't know who you are. You don't want to wait till the very end of a presentation, because then they all want to get out of there. Someplace about halfway or a third of the way through is when I find it the most useful to make the first pitch for people to sign up for, uh, for our email list. So that's what this uh, is in there for. I show them a picture of it. Anyway, how can, we, how can we work on this? We can first start by learning from how it's done, how healthcare is organized in other nations. And I would say that there are, to simplify it, there's really three models. There's first a model that I personally consider a relatively extreme model, a national health service. So this, is, um, this really is socialized medicine. Uh, this is where it's a publicly funded uh, uh, system for healthcare. It's publicly delivered. So the, the government uh, employs the physicians directly and owns most of the brick and mortar institutions. Um, so that, by definition, is socialism. As you know, socialism, socialism is defined as the government owning the means of production. So this is what it is. It works actually pretty well in many, from many points of view for Great Britain and even for the Veterans Administration if they weren't so drastically underfunded. Um, but you could make an argument that this is a good way to organize it. I don't think this is a model that's ever going to get uh, dominant traction in the United States, and it's not the model that uh, has been, frankly, advanced you know, to the most part by, by Physicians for a National Health Program. It is a model. It, it is common in, across the world, um, but that, in my mind, is one extreme. And when I do this part of the presentation, again, out of character, I walk to the far side of the stage to kind of emphasize that, and then I walk to the other far side, the closer side of the stage, the other end of the stage, and I point, and I say that I call the other extreme Wild Wild West Health Insurance. And this is, we're the only country in the world that has this model. Uh, it is mixed funded, as we just saw, very complex uh, uh, structure, mixed delivery with all kinds of different uh, models built in. Uh, it is incredibly expensive to do it this way, and it creates all kinds of gaps. And again, we are the only country in the world that does this. So almost by definition, you could call our current model in the U.S. an extreme model. But there is a conservative model right in the middle. There's a conservative model right in the middle where we don't talk about having government delivery of health care. We're just talking about the finance. We are only talking about the finances for the model that we're actually trying to advance. So it's publicly funded, right, and we'll go through some detail around that. It's paid for essentially by our taxes. It's publicly funded, but it's privately delivered, privately delivered. So if you want to be in practice out on the street on the corner, if you want to be in a large group, however you want to organize your practice, and we will come back to that again in a moment, you can do that. It's privately delivered. This is exactly how healthcare is done as in Canada, and it is, if you think about it, exactly what Medicare, the incredibly popular program for seniors in the U.S., is, uh, is set up today. So um, it's, in my mind, something fabulous for the United States. Uh, there, are, there is actually a bill in Congress uh, for this, H.R. 676, and sometimes, depending on the friendliness of the audience, I'll stop there and ask them to repeat H.R. 676 with me, uh, and I have them repeat that for two reasons. One, it's incredibly fun to hear a big room say H.R. 676, and number two, if you want them to go home and read it, it helps them actually remember it to say it once or twice. So anyway, I, I'd say H.R. 676, and uh, this is the bill you can go home and read. It's about 30 pages long. It's double-spaced, big font. You can read the entire bill in an hour or two, and you will know more about uh, national health insurance than most people uh, do. Uh, the bill as written uh, doesn't have enough granularity to actually be the final bill. I'm sure when it gets more 
more uh, feet in Congress. It's got about 55 co-sponsors today. I'm sure when it gets further uh, through the, uh, the final stages, it would have more meat and potatoes built into it. But it does give you a terrific strategic approach to virtually everything that you're worried about today in terms of how to structure a solution to healthcare. So I recommend you Google HR 676, go to the PMHB website if you want to, and, uh, and, and read it. It's, it's an easy read. And, and you'll find it useful. It basically says just two things. It says improve Medicare and expand Medicare. Improve Medicare means fix the benefit design and deal with the financial barriers. So the benefits have really not changed very much since Medicare was passed in 1965, and there are some gaps. For example, I can send my diabetic off to a cardiologist or an ophthalmologist, but I can't get my diabetic to get an hour with a nutritionist. So there are some things in the benefit design that need to be fixed. Um, likewise, there are significant financial barriers to care with deductibles and co-pays built in. As a consequence of both of those problems, most seniors who can afford to do it today actually buy additional insurance beyond their Medicare. They buy a supplement or a wrap, or they switch into one of the Advantage programs. These things would no need to, would not have any reason to exist were you to do what needs to be done. If you, to fix, if you fix the benefit design and eliminated the financial barriers to care, you wouldn't need to be dealing with, do I buy a supplement, do I buy this one, do I buy that one? So it would be much simpler and much more robust for everyone. So that's improving Medicare and then expanding it to everybody. All, all Americans, the president, the mayor, the, you know, the professor, the you know, physicians, students, everybody. Everybody, coal miners, everybody in, everybody in the United States would be included in, in this. As an aside, I mentioned those specific people, the, the president and the mayor and such, because that seems to resonate with folks who, who some folks who, who would be a little bit more leery of this. So everybody, and I specifically call that out. If you did this, then you would roll up most other programs, and you wouldn't need to have uh, these sort of a, uh, dreadful fights that we have in states like mine, where we've not yet expanded Medicaid. And, and the future for that is looking more grim. So those whole acrimonious battles would, would disappear. So improve it and expand it. In other words, it would be publicly funded, a public agency organizing the, the health care finance, um, be privately delivered, as we mentioned. Now, if you think about this, this is incredibly important. Most physicians are no longer going into um, solo practice or even small group practice, but instead of them migrating into large group or really employed settings. Um, and when I give this talk, I ask people, if they're medical students, what they're planning to do when they graduate. And five years ago, I would have maybe 20% of people would raise their hand if they're going to go into a small group or solo. Today, it's the extraordinary medical student or resident who says they're planning to do that. People are migrating into these employed situations. Now understand, my personal preference, I chose my entire career to practice in a large group in an employed setting. I like that. I like the camaraderie. I like the group dynamic that gets going on. But that's me. I did that because I wanted to do that my entire career. But you shouldn't have to do that because you have to. Most physicians are not migrating into these large employed settings because they so desperately want to have more colleagues like that. They're migrating into these large employed settings because they can't stand how difficult we've made it to practice. And so they want to offload more of those administrative burdens onto, these, onto their employer. Well, like I said, that's fine if you want to practice in that, in that setting, but you shouldn't have to. You should be able to choose the practice setting that really meets what you want to do. Uh, so this is one of the things that a national health insurance model would better enable. You'd be more enabled to set up the kind of practice that you personally really want to have set up. And lastly, of course, this is a patient-centric model. Patients today need to check with their insurer to find out which doctor they can go see. They need to, and that changes at the drop of a hat. Their insurer is reasonably likely to misinform them when they're purchasing their insurance. So you know, today we're paying the insurance companies to tell us which doctors and hospitals we can't go see. That's just crazy. So a national health insurance model would, would re recover the choice of physicians and hospitals back to where it belongs, which is with patients, not with some Wall Street traded company. So what is a single payer model? Why are we using this phrase single payer? Let me maybe try to help make this more clear. So on the left of this um, screen, you see all of us, right? Americans, all different sizes and shapes and colors. And on the right, you see what we all want. We want physicians, we want hospital, we want access to medications. And in between, of course, is the money. 
And the money is managed by a wealth of payers. It's managed by the federal government for the post office employees and all the other federal employees and for Medicare and Medicaid and such. It's, it's, it's managed by, by cities, by states, by universities, by businesses, and by a wealth of, of, uh, of insurance companies. Those are all, uh, in this language, payers. So we have a multiple payer system. It's very complicated, as you can, as you can see. Instead, we would replace all that noise in the middle, all that expensive noise in the middle, with one payer. Our tax dollars uh, essentially would go into one um, quasi-governmentally organized uh, um, um, system, which then would handle uh, the payments, uh, probably on a regional basis, but essentially just one simple clear flow. So that's why it's called a single payer model. You've heard other ways of describing it. That's also called national health insurance or Medicare for all. National health insurance, of course, emphasizes the insurance aspect of this rather than the payer aspect. And Medicare for all emphasizes the phrase, emphasizes uh, the, 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 that the simplest way to get there would be to build it on Medicare. So um, if some folks who, to whom we're speaking have found that it's difficult to figure out what's the difference between national health insurance and single payer and Medicare for all, uh, the reason they find it hard to figure out what that difference is is because there essentially is no difference. These are emphasizing different aspects of the solution, but they are essentially synonyms. So you'll find these words used interchangeably and don't worry about trying to sort out which one means what because they essentially mean the same thing if that's been confusing to you. Here's one uh, economic analysis of what it would cost. Uh, my background, as, you, as you, I told you, is, is from, in addition to clinical practice, uh, pretty heavily in the business community. Here's one uh, of, the, of the many economic analyses of, of uh, how this uh, how this would, what this would impact in, across the country. So this one in particular was done by uh, Jerry Friedman. It's publicly available uh, with a reference on the bottom left there. Uh, uh, Professor Friedman uh, was the chair of economics at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Uh, this is one analysis. There are maybe a dozen or so such analyses. There's one of these dozen or so that came out and said that actually would be expensive. That one particular one was done in a very, uh, one could argue, very partisan way recently. Uh, but other than that one, every other one of the analyses uh, done by economists shows either break-even, no new cost, or it shows, like this one does, a pretty significant savings. So uh, we'll populate these boxes in a moment. But the message is that it's either break-even or, by most analyses, actually a savings to the country to do this. Um, and it would do this and provide universal access to health care, which, of course, we don't have today, and it would do all of the other advantages that we talked about. So how does this work? How does this particular uh, set of data get populated? Let me show you. Understand, too, that this is one analysis. There are, as I said, many others. They all make different assumptions. They have different buckets of how they organize the cash, so it's, they, they have different numbers a, a bit. Uh, the conclusion, in general, is the same, but let me walk you through the one because it has a value conceptually, I think. So the first thing, of course, is that there would be new costs, right? Uh, we'd have to pay more for Medicaid patients. Uh, if I see a Medicaid patient today uh, with a 99213, I might get about 30 bucks in Missouri. If I see a, a Medicare patient in Missouri today, I might get about 100 bucks. And if I see a Blue Cross patient in Missouri today, I might get about 130 bucks for the exact same work. So what that means is that before I can let you into my practice, I have to assess the economic potential that you represent to my practice. And I frankly can't afford to see very many Medicaid patients because that's less than my current office structure costs. So that's crazy. I didn't go to medical school to figure out how to do an assessment of my patient's economic potential and that value to me as a physician. I went there to take care of patients because I love doing that part of it. So the first thing you notice on the left-hand side is that it would cost us more to take care of Medicaid patients. And by this analysis, since we'd be paying the same for everybody, by this analysis, roughly $74 billion. Uh, billion. And likewise, taking care of the uninsured would have a cost. And then finally, uh, all these folks uh, with a now improved benefit design would start doing more things. In particular, not so much more doctor visits, <laughs> somewhat of that, but they'd go to, they, they want home health, right? They want dentistry, they want other things. So utilization would go up by roughly that much. Now, let me pause here for a minute because some analyses in particular around the, uh, right before the primaries and right before the general, actually, some analyses that were in the Wall Street Journal and in USA Today stopped here and only showed the new costs and said 
G, that, that, that Medicare for All stuff sounds great, but our analyses show that there would be you know, tremendous new costs uh, on the system. And they don't mention the new savings. Now, my argument is that you can, we can uh, disagree about the philosophy and the strategy, and maybe it's not a great thing. We can, we can talk about the philosophy, but for crying out loud, we have to agree about the facts. And it's just patently unfair to only look at the new costs and not look at the new savings. That's misinforming the conversation. So, and that's done a lot. So let's look at the new savings, because they're, they're just as real. The new savings, uh, first of all, you see at the very bottom of this government administration, by this estimate, it would be a $23 billion savings. Now notice how small that number is compared to the other numbers. And that's in part because government-run health care programs are actually incredibly efficient, with incredibly low overhead. And I'll show you more data on that in a moment. We obviously have savings in health insurance administration, because most of that would probably disappear. The administrative costs to providers, physicians, and hospitals, which we started to talk about a few moments ago, uh, would also in dramatically fall. And for crying out loud, we have to negotiate the prices of drugs and devices, and there would be a, there would be a savings there. So at the end of the day, the savings have to be considered, and they are at least as big as the new costs, and by many analyses, such as this one, uh, significantly bigger. So. Um, we are the only country that does this kind of nonsense, so in terms of having all of this excess building and insurance related costs. So here's what billing and insurance related costs in single payer systems around the, around the world when you take a, a rough average of other modern nations. The costs don't go away, but they, but they remain at this level of the 10 or 20 uh, billion dollars. Were, were the United States performing uh, as the rest of the world does? But here's the extra, extra cost that we spend on billing and insurance related costs just in the United States by this analysis from about two years ago. Um, at the end of the day, it's uniquely American and, and it accounts for roughly $375 billion extra, extra money that we're spending. Very similar number to what some other analyses have shown. So how much is the savings? By this estimate, the savings that we're talking about for just dealing with the billing and insurance related piece is almost the entire amount the country spends today on Medicaid. It's a lot of money that we could save that we're just not getting any productive value out of. So why are we talking about basing everything on Medicare? Why would Medicare be the, be the model? It's far from perfect, but why use that? So let's look again at life expectancy because this is the piece of life expectancy that is not widely recognized. But it's from the Institute of Medicine, and I think it's a pretty interesting thing. We all know that as we get older, life expectancy goes up, right? Total life expectancy goes up because when you're when you're 70, you're not going to die of the things that you died at when you were 40. We know that whatever kills you when you're 40 isn't going to happen to you when you're 70. So 70-year-olds, 70 you all know that, 70-year-olds uh, have a, a longer potential full life expectancy than do 10-year-olds. So that's not what this chart is showing. This chart is showing you life expectancy compared in the United States as compared to 17 peer nations. Uh, like Australia, Austria, Canada, Denmark, Germany, France, countries that you would think we should be uh, compared against pretty much. Our life expectancy by age cohort. So how are our 10-year-olds ranked? What, how is the life expectancy of an American 10-year-old compared to the life expectancy of other 10-year-olds in other peer nations? How is the life expectancy of a 55-year-old in the United States compared to the life expectancy of a 55-year-old in these other peer nations? So here's the USA rank. And as you can predict that when I reveal the data, we're going to be at the bottom. And indeed, that's what it shows until we turn 65. And that's the part that you probably are not as aware of, which is that once we turn 65 or a few years after that, because it's, you know, medicine's not magic, it doesn't happen immediately. But once we get into the Medicare age group, our life expectancy skyrockets and actually begins to recover its position in the world such that we are our older group is perhaps the, the best life expectancy or near the best life expectancy um, in the world. So, so Medicare helps us in terms of life expectancy. Medicare is also highly efficient. Here's, here's the overhead for insurance companies, the, the four larger insurance companies, uh, or most current data that we have, first quarter of 2016. Um, and this is essentially the medical loss ratio minus uh, taken away from 100%. So, so this is public data, SEC, SEC filings uh, of interest. These numbers haven't really changed much in the last five years since the passage of the ACA, which was supposed to have 
improved at, but it, these numbers are at, by SEC filings are actually pretty flat. So 15, 20% ish range overhead. And then here's traditional Medicare, 1.4% overhead according to the Medicare Trust Fund report. Um, should that number be higher? Perhaps. Um, but this number by itself is actually all inclusive. This includes the overhead of having a having the, the government building or the rent on the building or the mortgage depreciation of the building. It includes the cost of IRS staff that collect the taxes on which Medicare through which Medicare is funded. Um, it should perhaps be a little bit higher. Many have said maybe they should have more money to pay to spend on, on fraud and abuse. So okay, maybe it should be two percent. Traditional Medicare though has a is a remarkably efficient system, and of course it does because they don't have to do all of the underwriting and marketing and all of the wasteful, complicated gaming that the insurance companies uh, all spend huge resources on. So of course it's more effective in that sense. If you add in the privatized parts of Medicare, Part C, uh, you know, Medicare Advantage, and the pharmacy benefit, Part D, which of course is also privatized, the overhead goes up to about 6%. Even with that, though, it's a dramatically better number than, than uh, so Medicare is highly efficient. Let's look at a real life experiment. If you think about it, uh, in 1971, we embarked on this experiment with Canada. It's not usually presented that way, but we did. Before 1971, life expectancy in the United States was almost the same as life expectancy in Canada. We were a little less than a year apart. So we were almost the same life expectancy. Now that's an important factor because when we talk about this, oftentimes people will say, "Well, our country is so big, so diverse. You know, it's you know you can't really you know draw lessons from other countries." Well, then why were we the same? Why were we almost the same? But we haven't changed that much since 1971. Pre-1971, our life expectancies were almost the same, and we were spending almost the same amount of our GDP on healthcare along the same trend over time. So we were the same, same cost, same life expectancy. And then in 1971, uh, President Richard Nixon signed into law the HMO Act, and that's the year roughly when Canada fully implemented their national health insurance. They started a few years before, but around 1971 is when it was fully implemented. So how did this pan out? Well, here's our health care cost as a percentage of GDP. It's hard to see much of an impact in 1971, and since the bill was passed ostensibly to reduce the cost of health care, it hasn't really made much of an impact. We're getting pretty close to 19% uh, at this point. That data you've seen, here's Canada's data, which is not as well recognized. Canada, until 1971, was following the same cost curve and now is not. So it's not just that they negotiated prices. That would have been a drop along the y-axis, but not a change in the slope of the curve. And as you can see, the curve actually changed. So that's a big difference. That's when they fully implemented it. They also now have significantly less unmet health care needs. So 14% of Americans would report today that they have an unmet health care need, and 11% of Canadians would say that. That's a big difference all by themselves. What is it in the United States? 1% would say that they have an unmet health care need because of a waiting list or a service that's unavailable. We have some of that here. 8%, the dominant reason in the United States that Americans have unmet health care needs is because of the cost of health care and then a smattering of other things. In Canada, it's a little bit different mix. In Canada, guess what? There actually is an issue with waiting lists or unavailable services. Now, bear in mind, that's not for the life-threatening, life-mattering things. That's for typically for things like orthopedic surgery for your back or your knee. Canadians hate this problem. They hate their waiting lists. They're, they're, if you interview them on the street, as was done in the first healthcare movie, that's really interesting in watching those interviews, they will almost all quickly tell you that they don't like the waiting list. But in the next breath, they will also all say, but you know, I don't have to sell my house if I get leukemia. I don't need a bake sale to pay for my cancer. Um, and how you Americans live with that, they would say, is barbaric. So they also have a percentage of my health care needs due to cost. Again, things aren't perfect in Canada. We can have a whole discussion of that topic. Uh, but for example, Canadian uh, Medicare doesn't have a pharmacy benefit. Most people buy that privately. Um, and then other reasons. So yes, there's an issue with a waiting list, but it's it's put it in context. They're spending half of what we're spending. Uh, and if we uh, if we didn't cut to half of what we're spending, which we don't need to do, this wouldn't even be a case here. The last most important thing in my mind is look at life expectancy. And this data set, uh, the oldest that I have meaningful data, goes back to 1979. And at that point, uh, Canadians were living a year longer than we were. And now they're living two and a half years longer than we are. 
two and a half years. So um, that's enough for this experiment, right? Uh, we started this experiment, and now one group spends half, has less on health care needs, and lives two and a half years longer. It's time to stop this experiment. So what would this mean for physicians? What does this have to do, what would be the impact on, on physicians? First, as you probably know, we're not the happiest group of physicians in the world. As a matter of fact, we're almost the least happiest group of physicians in the world. There we are off on the right. Uh, uh, German physicians tend to be actually less happy than we are. I don't no, I suspect that there's other cultural things impacting that, but at any rate, we're not a happy, happy lot. Um, and it turns out that career, our satisfaction with our career is related to how much time we spend doing non-clinical documentation and communication. So we tend to be the, the happiest of us are spending uh, barely eight hours on non-clinical administrative work. And as we get over nine hours or ten hours or more, we become less and less happy. So we're spending, in general, twice as much time on the electronic health records and on desk work as we do with patients. We're spending more time doing stuff like that than we are directly with patients. That doesn't make us happy. In Canada, here's just medicine, uh, data for family medicine in Canada, but I'm sure the data is similar for, for other specialties too. In Canada, the average Canadian physician is averaging 2.4 hours per week on non-clinical administration, 2.4. So put that in context. We're happy when we can get down below nine, and they're two and a half hours a week. So it also turns out it's less expensive to practice in Canada. Canadian physicians have about 28% overhead for their practice, family physicians. And in the United States, as you know, we're roughly 55% overall. Um, and malpractice is a, is a big piece of this. Think of what you spend on malpractice. Here's what Canadians spend. Why would their malpractice expense be lower than ours? Well, there's a cultural thing, perhaps, but, but when, why do people sue us? They sue because there was a bad outcome, whether it was our fault or not is not even the key factor, but there was a bad outcome. And the bad outcome leaves many people worried, who's going to pay for the future cost of medical care? Well, if the future cost of medical care is embedded in the benefit design it, that everybody has access to, they don't need to worry about that as much. And so the reason to sue is is reduced. And then at the end of the day, the biggest chunk of the judgment when we are when, when we it is found against us, the biggest chunk of the judgment is for um, the future cost of medical care. So the size of the judgment is much smaller, and the frequency of judgments is much smaller. So malpractice. And if you think about it, when you go talk to your state legislators and you identify yourself as a physician. The first thing they'll say to you is, I know, malpractice, malpractice, malpractice. Because that's all they're used to hearing us talk about, but it doesn't have to be that way. Physician incomes in Canada, I'll just, I usually just put this slide up and pause for a moment, let folks look at it. Because, uh, you know, these are Canadian dollars, um, and the loony has been swoony, so it's, you know, it's hard to exactly compare. Uh, taxes are different in Canada, but at the end of the day, these are pretty good incomes. These are pretty good incomes. Turns out that it's also just really tough to practice here in the United States. The average physician in Missouri uh, has over $200,000 in accounts receivable. And so when I talk to medical students, I tell them what that is. Accounts receivable, as you know, is stuff that you did, that you care that you delivered, for which you think you should be paid, and that you submitted a bill for. So it's not charity work. It's not somebody you saw without insurance and who for whom you decided you were going to do this work for free. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about stuff that you did, that you expected to be paid for, that you submitted a bill for, and that you haven't been paid. And the average physician in Missouri, and probably elsewhere too, it's hard data to get, the average physician in Missouri has over $200,000 of accounts receivable, and it's nearly 12 month old, their accounts receivable fund. So it's, that's tough to bear as a practice. As a result of all this, American physicians have actually been moving into Canada. So we all know Canadian physicians who have moved here. Um, they've got gray hair in general. American physicians the last 10 or 15 years have been moving into Canada. There's a net move into Canada. And Canadian physicians who did expatriate the last 10 or 15 years have been repatriating. So again, we know physicians uh, from Canada who are practicing in the US. They didn't come here last week. They typically came here before 2003, 2004. There's still some that come, but in general, you know, if you say if you if you're afraid that Canadian physicians can't stand practicing there, well, then why are they returning? They're not. They actually 
they actually find that a much better practice model than what we have to offer. Here's one example. Uh, Dr. Zolzala was published uh, not too long ago as, uh, as pointing out that this accounts receivable issue and all the nonsense is just too complicated. And so he actually moved, as one example, from the United States into Canada where he's found that 2% of his bills aren't covered as compared to the data that we just showed you. So how would this impact positions? It would decrease our administrative burdens, it would increase our satisfaction in practice, and it would preserve our earning potential. This is probably why most physicians, last time they were surveyed, actually came out in favor of a national health insurance model. 59% uh, overall, the data was done in two, that was collected in 2007. Uh, there hasn't been a survey that I'm aware of across the entire country like this since then, uh, but a lot has changed since 2007, and I suspect if this survey were done again, uh, our the support among physicians would be would be even higher, but I don't have that data doesn't hasn't been prepared as far as I as far as I know. So there are some specialties that are more strongly in in favor of a national health insurance model, some that are a little less strongly. It doesn't fall below 20 percent anywhere. Um, most specialties it's north of 50 percent, um, and indeed the overall average is 59 percent uh, support us. So when I close up, I make another pitch for give us your give us your contact information. And that's the information. That's the that's my version of the grand rounds. And I think we have some time for questions. And I have a question. Um, <laughs> You, you went over a number of the, the pieces about uh, what doctors have to do with insurance companies when doctors you know, basically don't want insurance companies in their exam room with them. Uh, but some doctors might say, well, with a single payer system with um, Medicare for all, I'd be getting the government in my exam room with me. Um, what do you take to the doctors? Who yeah, that's a, uh, before you study the question, before you study the, the issue, uh, that's, that's something that people bring up. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize that we don't want that either. That, um, that's, and, that, and that's not what this is about, frankly. Today, we have the insurance companies telling us what to do. We like to, we like to think that we're in control of that, that if we don't like what an insurance company tells us, that we could just not take that insurance company anymore. But frankly, it's really hard for, for a large practice to simply walk away from a, one of the main insurance companies in the, in the country. So, and you have almost no influence over what they're going to tell you, and, uh, and, and you're, you're, not, you're just, you know, you, we're today in that situation. Uh, on the other hand, if you have the, 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 a single payer system, there's, there's no conflict of interest here. Number one, in other countries that do this, physicians have not reported that as a concern. In other countries that do this, physicians don't report that the, that the government is telling them what to do. And in fact, there's no reason to. It, it typically, when a, when a private insurance company is telling physicians what to do or what not to do, it's designed as a part of their profit system. Maybe there's some quality initiatives which haven't really panned out to demonstrate any solid evidence of improving quality outcomes generally. Um, they're typically setting up those programs saying, prescribe this drug, not that drug. Uh, use this hospital, not this hospital. Uh, get your CAT scan here and not there. They're setting those things up on us primarily as a way of controlling cost uh, and, and their own, for their own profit. Whereas in a national health insurance model, you wouldn't be having that. We'd have one payer, we'd have one pharmacy benefit design, we'd have one network, which would be virtually everybody. The, this wouldn't be an issue. This isn't an issue in other countries when they do it. And at the end of the day, were it to be an issue, these would be they would be subject to our electoral process. So uh, it's not really a concern. I don't, it's not, it's not a, a, an important concern, I don't think. I guess I can look at some of these uh, uh, emailed in uh, messages. One was, uh, what's the next step with this new administration? And I wish I could tell you the answer to that. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think at this point the focus needs to be on, uh, frankly, a bit different from where we've been as an organization until recently. Um, we need to be talking about protecting the benefits that we have gotten from the Affordable Care Act and then moving on to a better improved system, which as we all know is a national health insurance system. I think we need to join the other progressives in the healthcare community and rally to defend uh, many of the important 
uh, steps forward of, of the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is far from what we want, and I won't belabor that. We all know the many reasons why that's the case. But I think it's important to, to say that we want to protect the advantages of the ACA and move forward to the next stage, which is a national health insurance uh, program, and do that with our uh, colleagues and, and allies and adjacent allies. Uh, HR 676 uh, is the next question, and I don't think it's acquired any new sponsors, so I think it's, um, is it Matt or someone can correct me or chime in, I think it's 56 co-sponsors. Um, so it's there, and I'm sure it'll be resubmitted again, but it's not, uh, uh, you know, it, it hasn't advanced further in the last few months as far as I, I'm, I'm aware. Uh, Arch 10 is asking, uh, on the administrative hours of over nine hours compared to Canada's 2.5, was there a difference between the ER, EMR time versus billing time? The, the numbers that I showed you was about non-EMR time. It was non-clinical. EMR was not included in that. So um, it's the non-clinical administrative time as far as I know the data there. Um, do I have any insights into why the Netherlands privatized their healthcare system? No, I, I can't say I do. So if others, if others do, uh, Chime in. I don't. I don't have any depth of knowledge about the, the changes in the Netherlands. Uh, what do I say to providers who complain about macro complexity and use that to say government complicates our lives too? I think there's some. I think there's some validity to that, and I think that's related to how complex the overall system is. And the point, of course, is that we can streamline this. That's a response to to trying to design band-aids and patchwork over an incredibly complicated system. Whereas we can do better than that. What's the AMA's position about our health about healthcare system and single payer? I'm not sure the AMA represents uh, anybody but the AMA at this point. <laughs> but uh, but um, you know they've not been exactly our strongest ally in our fight for a national health insurance system. Um, I understand that they're actually fawning over um, over the new uh, over price um, as. <laughs> But yeah, they're not exactly our biggest allies. Uh, there, other organizations are much, much better allies. The uh, American College of Physicians is not overtly advocating for uh, for national health insurance, but in their analyses of it, they they overtly describe it as a very sensible strategy. I know privately a lot of them are are, are strong allies. Uh, the American Academy of Family Physicians uh, recently had their House of Delegates meeting and referred on. Uh, for, for study but more about uh, national health insurance and indeed six of the last um, 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 a, uh, double AFP uh, presidents uh, came up and made a strong statement in favor of national health insurance so I think there's advanced there. P uh, pediatrics has also been, uh, been been pretty supportive although not not overtly advocating for it because uh, they, they too see the complexity of our situation. Uh, thanks, thanks Wink. Nice comments. Um, and I don't know. Is that, I, I can't say I'm I'm expert on what the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics uh, says about this. I've not looked too too closely on it. So if anybody else wants to has expertise, that they can chime in. Um, do I, why do I think CPR has not achieved a larger support in the medical community? Well, I would I would first question the uh, your, your assumption there. I would say that if nine years ago we had 59% of physicians supporting it, I'd say that is pretty good support. And when you look at uh, surveys that have been done on a smaller scale in a variety of states, it's it's much higher than that uh, more recently. So I would say that we do have support. Why are there not more physicians out there uh, fighting and advocating for it? I think it's because they they don't share our belief that this is something that we can actually do. Uh, most major social changes seem nearly impossible until they're accomplished, and it's our job to get them to agree to to help us fight for it. Plus, you know, I don't think they realize how popular it is among their colleagues. I myself was afraid to start speaking about this until I saw the numbers, about 59% of our colleagues are already supporting it. And then when I got a list of the members that are in my area and I saw that actually some people who we've never talked about with had already signed in to PNHP, um, it, it got me more comfortable talking about it because most of us spend our career focused on our patients, of course, but also focused on building our brand as competent, caring physicians. And we don't want to be branded crazy. We don't want to be branded uh, excessively political. So I think it's one of our jobs is to help them realize that they can, uh, they can get further on this. 
another point that I'd just like to make, if you're if you're um, curious about how to communicate these messages to um, to other audiences, um, it's easy to talk about this with groups that already agree with you, and that's important. You know, the choir needs a juice box. It's important to have those conversations, but it's almost more important to be willing to engage in these discussions with groups that aren't aren't already inclined to agree with you. And I have two tools that can maybe help you if you're trying to speak to less than completely natural um, allies. One is uh, go to YouTube, and I think it's on the PNHP website too. I've actually done a half an hour, a 30 minute or so uh, video uh, that's called Progressive Persuasions. Progressive Persuasions. Uh, that's a pretty good, I think, discussion of this. A lot of that is based on book uh, on a book by Jonathan Haidt, or Haidt, I think it's pronounced H-A-I-D-T, a book called The Righteous Mind. I recommend looking at that. Uh, and there's actually an article that I wrote in the Minnesota Physician which is public domain, Minnesota Physician. It's on the PNHP website now, too. Uh, or you can just go straight to the Minnesota Physician and, uh, and see a little article about, the, about that. Um, so, yeah, local chapters can definitely use this presentation and these the scripts. Uh, and that's, you know, I'm not talking to you to try to teach you about this stuff. I'm talking to you because you all know all this stuff. I'm talking to you today to give you comfort at becoming a speaker. We're not going to get anywhere by by one of us talking to a couple dozen, or actually we have a nice little group of people within PNHP, that's not the message. The message is <laughs> we all have to get out there and talk, and all these slides that we've built that David and Steffi and others spend so much of their life uh, researching and building, and I spent a little bit of time prettying up a little bit, um, we do that work not because for no other reason than for you to take it and run with it. We have There's no pride of authorship. Take it, run with it. You know, reorganize it in a way that you're comfortable with, and 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 go with it. Um, how do you? How much do you think single payer rejection has to do with people looking at it? It's, yeah, so so that is one of the things that the, the one of the key messages from um, the AMA had been uh, for decades has been that single payer is socialism or communism, and they're overt about that in the past, and that's why someplace in the middle you saw that frame that I gave of. Uh, of, of uh, one extreme being uh, being a national health service, another extreme on the other side being being um, uh, what I called wild wild west medicine. I deliberately overemphasize that difference. I deliberately walked to one side of the stage and on the other side of the stage because I want to frame uh, national health insurance as a conservative model. I want to emphasize that it is not socialism. It's uh, not that there's anything for or against socialism and what I'm saying, but I want to make the point that we're not even talking about that. We're just talking about giving everybody access to, to health care. Um, boy, the comments are coming in faster than I can get ready. Um, Wesley Clark uh, said, thank you for emphasizing the simplicity. I, I think most people don't realize that with single payer, all those fruitless and time-wasting calls to insurance companies would be history to say nothing of doctors and go do the patient care instead of communicating. Yeah, I think that's really important to emphasize the simplicity. Uh, Jonathan Cox says the UK is not a totally pure example of socialized medicine. That's true. I you know, I apologize for the way I present this as overly simplified. But you know, when you have 45 minutes at best to try to make these points, it's pretty hard not to overly simpl overly simplify things. And I, I hope I made that point when I was was characterizing it in that way. But um, you know, you're, you're exactly right, um, um, Jonathan, but there's, it's, it's not as simple as I posted it. Uh, the slides uh, will be on the PNHP website. A couple of you asked that. So yeah, the slides will definitely be up on the website. Uh, and do with them as you wish. I have no fight of authorship. When you're, when you're working with them, uh, just a pitch, if, you're, if you have trouble with the formatting or you're trying to modify them in a way for, for your own use or you want, you want to add something or, or do something, and, you, and if you don't have the, the PowerPoint skills that is required for that, uh, reach out to me, and I am. I, if you're working on a presentation, you know, for a, about national health insurance, I am more than glad to be your resource. So I would be glad to work with you one on one to make the deck exactly fit the way you speak and the audience that you need to get to. So use me. You can get to get me through PNHP. Uh, easy to easy to reach me. Hmm. Anybody else? We're pretty close to time, which is always a goal. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ed, for this wonderful presentation. 
Um, to, to those on the webinar, if you're interested in being a speaker for PNHP, uh, you can reach out to us. Um, email the uh, actually, you can email me directly, matt, M-A-T-T, at pnhp.org. Um, if you are already a speaker and doing speaking engagements for us, please let us know when you have those engagements so we can keep track of them. Um, and the slides um, will be made available both on the website and we'll email them out to everyone who registered for the webinar. Again, thank you, Ed, um, and thank you, everyone, for participating.